Heavenly Father, we want to declare that together. We thank you that we are um, a people, uh, your church gathered here this morning. Um, and we thank you that we can declare uh, actually the truth that nothing compares with the promise that we have in you. Um, our eyes are often blind to that truth. So we ask, Father, that as we appear into the truth of your word this morning, uh, that you would make that more and more a reality to us that we would be able to go from here at least more confidently being able to say nothing, nothing compares to the promise that we have in you. Uh, so help us to, to see Christ in your word and all those promises we pray. We do so need your help. So we ask that you would help us in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, just before we start, do we, do we need, have any of the youngsters gone through that need to, Perhaps to be in here now because they've started at school, secondary school. I'm thinking of some of my own daughter walked past. Is it the last? Is it counts as the last week? So we're okay about that. Okay, that's cool. All right. Um, while I just take a swig of water, why don't you turn up Habakkuk chapter one, which was on page 662 of the Church Bibles? Because um, we're going to be referred to that. And no, don't worry, you haven't heard it wrong. We're not beginning, beginning a new series this autumn uh, in the book of Habakkuk. Um, we're actually going to be starting a new series in the book of Romans, which I'm anticipating will be starting next Sunday. And for those of you that know the book of Romans, um, that, that's a really exciting prospect. Excuse me, that water. That's a really exciting prospect. Is that a clap for Romans? Yeah, yeah, great. You, you, you. You're excited about that, Linda. That's fabulous. Great. Okay. So, so that'll be good. Uh, I'm sure you're looking forward to that. No, um, as I was thinking about this Sunday, which is like one of those Sundays where we kind of stand on the edge of, of a new term and the autumn and all the rest of it. And we've still got a few people away and a few people here. Um, uh, uh, the, the Lord laid this particular passage on my heart, something to, to open up with you. So let's, let's have a look at this. Habakkuk chapter one. Um, and as I say that, I've got to turn to it. Okay. Um, okay. So let me begin like this. I wonder what's gone wrong in this last week for you. There's bound to be something that's gone wrong, some problem that you've had. Perhaps you've brought that the thought of that uh, here this morning, and it's overwhelming. Something that's um, that's going wrong. Um, or uh, differently, how are things looking as you as you look ahead into the autumn or into the next week? Um, are there things that are making you feel apprehensive that you're worried about that are bothering you? Yeah. So think about some of those things at the moment. What seems to be going wrong at the moment for you? Um, and what are some of the things that you're worried about that you're kind of apprehensive about as you look forward? Just try and capture those for a moment. Just, that'd be helpful. Um, because I want to say something this morning um, that is often lost and is often not said, kind of smoothed over in a way, um, or said, um, yeah, w- without without the simplicity. So I want to say it simply as simply as I can, and it's a simple and profound truth. And if we grasp it, it's absolutely wonderful, and it changes everything. It changes everything, and that is this: it is the truth that nothing ever goes wrong. Nothing ever goes wrong. That is at the heart of God's message to Habakkuk that we've just been reading. Think about what a difference it would make to know that nothing ever goes wrong. When I was preparing this message, the garage door broke in our house. That's a, that's a pathetic example. But for me, that had gone wrong. I mean, that caused all sorts of problems. Okay? Things do seem to go wrong, don't they? And, and as, as I'm standing here now, I'm trying to think, what are the things that you were, you were grasping at the beginning there? Things that you're worried about. Things that seem to be going wrong. Things that as you look out on the next week, you're, you know, they're, 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 things seem to be going wrong. What, what are they? I'm not not sure because I don't know you well enough. We've had the holiday break and I've not spoken to lots of you in it. So I've got a little list here and I don't know whether any of this is going to connect. I didn't get the results I was expecting. 
I don't know. Maybe that was you. There's a problem at work. Um, or I can't get work, which might apply here as well. Um, maybe uh, I've got too much on my plate. I just feel overwhelmed with stuff. Or maybe you, you, you can have the opposite problem, can't you? I haven't got enough. I'm bored out of my mind. I haven't got enough to do. Um, maybe uh, everything to do with your finances seem to be going wrong. Um, Perhaps everything about a relationship that matters to you seems to be going wrong. Um, and on, in, during this holiday, um, we've been at a funeral supporting a mum whose 20 year old daughter died of cancer after, humanly speaking, a pretty rubbish 20 years of her life anyway. It was pretty rough. Um, how can how can we, how knowing all those things, the things that you know in your own life, and some of those things we just mentioned, how can we say nothing ever goes wrong? Well, the truth is, and it's a very simple truth. Above all that, it is true to say nothing ever goes wrong. How so? How so, Anthony? Well, because we need to remind ourselves that behind life as we know it is the God of the Bible, and He has an intention, and we might call it God's plan. We often refer to it like that. That may be an easy way to refer to it. God's plan. Yeah? Um, And sometimes we treat God's plan like a mysterious thing, um, like a kind of a secret that nobody's let let us in on. Um, And I kind of, as I was thinking about that this week, I was thinking it's a little bit, I would call it like the Kentucky Fried Chicken plan because I think I've got a picture we can start with. I've got a few pictures to help. Kentucky Fried Chicken. It's a mystery. Kentucky Fried Chicken. Ordering food at KFC is a mystery, isn't it? I mean, you you go up there to the counter and you order a bucket or whatever it is. And then there's all these little extras that you don't know anything about. Oh, you can have an extra two pieces of chicken and it's this extra. Or you can have some popcorn chicken and that'll cost you 150. Or you can have the popcorn chicken and the chips and we'll knock 25% off that. And it's like completely confusing. So when we go in as a family to Kentucky Fried Chicken, which is rare, but when we do, I stand at the counter, I'm kind of bamboozled with all this mystery. And, I, and then two minutes later, I'm sat down and in front of me this food and I don't know how it got there and I don't know what I ordered and I don't know how it happened but it's just a complete mystery. Does anybody else know what I mean? Trying to order food at Kentucky Fried Chicken. Trying to know what's right. You know, what, what's going on behind their extras and all the rest of it. It's completely confusing. Well, I find it confusing anyway. Some of you obviously, are, you, you're more adept at it than me. Um, but it's completely, it's, it's like a mystery. It's like a complete mystery. What is the secret? There is somebody that knows. It's the, the lady behind the till. She is the one, the knowing one. And you've somehow got to try and get the information out of her to be able to, 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 to get the order that is going to be right for you. But she knows and you kind of, she's the knowing one. Well, I think sometimes we think of God's plan like a mystery like that, like a bit confusing, a mystery. Um, and I think we think it's dead Christian to say things like, well, God must have a purpose behind this, whatever it might be, and all will be revealed one day. Um, but really, I think most of the time that's an excuse for, getting, for, for our getting on with, with our plan in the hope that somewhere down the track, our plan and God's plan will, will intersect and come together. And I think that's often how, uh, how we live. Um, well, we're talking this morning about God's plan, what he is intentional about. And his plan is his glory, which is revealed as men and women, boys and girls, come to believe that he has made a way to be right with him, um, to be rescued from the wrath that we deserve by sending his son, Jesus Christ, to die on the cross for our sins in our place. Um, that's God's big plan. That's, that, there's no mystery to it. It means glory for God and it means fantastic good news for us. That's his plan. It's not mysterious. It's not Kentucky Fried Chicken puzzling. It's, uh, that is it. Okay. And because he is God and because it's his intention, It means that nothing ever goes wrong. It means nothing has ever gone wrong. 
because that is planning it's happening and it means this time tomorrow when i look back whatever will have happened this will still be true nothing ever went wrong nothing ever goes wrong i mean that's got to be worth an amen hasn't it nothing ever goes wrong because it's his plan he's behind it his intention glory for him good for you and me amen you know i'm convinced that you and i are controlled by the fear of things going wrong of things not working out how i want and if you want convincing about that think about just this last week when when have we include myself in this when have we been anxious and when have we been short-tempered or when have we been angry or when have we been moody just the other day <laughs> every well there you go and i bet when we think about it it didn't have anything to do with that that grand plan that i've just been talking about that wasn't the reason why we were down yeah um it was really, let's face it, it was because we were paddling around in our own little puddle of a plan and we had lost sight of that great, magnificent ocean of God's plan that we're talking about, thinking about there. And things can go wrong in my puddle of a plan, and they frequently do all the time. But all of human history is marching unstoppably to the beat of God's great salvation plan. And to that end, nothing has ever, nothing is ever, and nothing will ever go wrong. And if we could just grasp that, if we could just grasp it, it would be so liberating. It would be so liberating. Two great and glorious implications of that that naturally follow that I just want to share with you. Pen out for you okay number one great and glorious implication number one however things look and if you're making notes you might want to write this one down number one however things look this is one grand plan that you and i can't break can't break however things look this is one grand plan you and i can't break um and another picture for you now just go back one um back in worcester where i was growing up there was a shop called Prattley's or um, G.R. Prattley and Sons, uh, as it's most properly known or should be properly known. Um, these days, if you want to buy uh, crockery, you know what I mean by crockery, are plates, cups, that sort of thing, you get them from a supermarket mostly, don't you? Or Ikea. But in the days before supermarkets and Ikea sold plates and bowls and stuff, you go to a place like Prattley's for your stuff. And it was in the days when people used to buy, if, it, if you got married, you get, you get a, 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 a tea set. A, a, is that what you call it? A, a dinner service, a dinner set for your wedding present, wouldn't you? Somebody give me a nod. That's, that's, that's what used to happen. It doesn't happen so much these days. But that was, really, that was, that was a really thing wasn't it so places like this were were really popular and this this was probably so most of it closed down now actually but it was that was that was there and um now now the other thing to this story you need to know is let's be honest with kids there are two types of kids okay there is the, the there is the child that sees a a stack of plates china plates and thinks if i could just push that over I could create real mayhem. That would be fantastic. Okay. That, that child A. Okay. Then there's a child B who would be oh, absolutely frightened at the prospect of that because they just don't want to, you know, don't want to do anything naughty. Yeah. And they would never, never, never do anything like that. Okay. Um, now I was child B. Okay. It's true. It's true. That was that was me. Um, I, I, I would I, I would hated to have caused embarrassment to my family or, or whatever by breaking some plates. But I know that there are others who would think that was a fantastic thing to do. So I'm looking at Matty and looking at Kosh. Um, not sure about you, Andy. A, B, not sure. Um, Peter's definitely an A, yeah. Whoa, whoa, what that one over. Okay. So I know that there are two sides, but I was definitely the B. So I am... Um, I had some sisters as well, and my mum used to take us up the aisles. This is, this is, they look wider there than they actually were. And there's all the crockery stacked up. You take us up the aisles. Um, absolutely, we were absolutely petrified. We would step on this tiny little line 
Um, because, you know, all these plates stacked up left and right, you've only got to just touch or knock it, and it all come crashing down. <sighs> we used to walk up those aisles absolutely petrified. And I don't know how my mum ever really got the, the guts to take us up there, but, but we did. Why have I shown you that picture? Because I, we, I think we go through life like that. I think a lot of us, we go through, a lot of the time we go through life like, life like that. If we, could, if we could see into one another's hearts, we'd see anxiety that says, I'm going to do something that brings disaster, that brings it all crashing down like that. And we do, because we teach it to our kids. If you don't get good exam results, you won't get a good job, and then you won't be able to afford food, and then you will die. Disaster. Doom. We don't say it like that, but we might as well. The way we talk about it, anybody would think that it's true, isn't it? Don't keep picking that scab. If you, if you pick that scab, then it'll go septic, and then we'll have to chop your arm off, and then you will die. We just say it like that, don't we? We don't actually use the words, but we might as well say it like that. How exactly does that act upset God's intentions to save me for all eternity through faith in Jesus Christ? It does not. It does not. You know, one way of picturing our inability to impact this ocean of a wonderful plan is to think of a tsunami wave. I've got that picture off the internet. You know, look at that. I don't know if you can see the scale there, but these are the little buildings, the, the, the buildings there next to the wave. And imagine, and imagine, you know, being on a lilo just beneath that wave. You know, which direction is everything going to go? Where is everything going? If you're on a little lilo, are you going to change that? Are you going to make any difference? I just wanted to give you a picture in your head of our complete inability to break, to change this wonderful ocean of God's. Uh, salvation plan I can make all sorts of things go wrong um, all sorts of things can go wrong but you and I cannot make that go wrong okay whatever has happened whatever is happening whatever is going to happen has not is not and will not ever bend God's great salvation plan one fraction of a degree and if I'm a Christian this morning that is a great thing to hear that's a great thing to hear one glorious implication, that was one. Second glorious implication of this truth is that however things look, God doesn't get it wrong. God doesn't get it wrong either. And that's what God says to Habakkuk in our reading today. Okay, So I hope you've got that open on page 662. This is Habakkuk. Okay, He's saying, from where I'm standing, it's going wrong, God. I'm praying, but you're not answering. So have a look at verse 2. Uh, How long, O Lord, must I call for help, but you do not listen? Or cry out to you violence, but you do not save? And and then Habakkuk is saying, I've told you about all the evil that I see that's all about. But God, you're just letting it all go. Verse 3, why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrong? Destruction and violence are before me. There is strife and conflict abounds. Therefore, the law, your good law, God, is paralyzed, is hamstrung, and justice never prevails. In other words, your standard of right and wrong never wins out. The wicked hem in the righteous so that justice is perverted. But remember our heading. Um, However things look, God doesn't get it wrong. He doesn't get it wrong. So God speaks in verse 5. When Matty read it, he, we, 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 um, he, obviously it was his own voice for the whole reading. But verses 2 to 4, we've just heard there, is Habakkuk with the problem. And then God speaks in verse 5. Um, you don't see an answer to your prayers, Habakkuk? God's saying... Look at verse 5. Look at the nations and watch and be utterly amazed, for I'm going to do something in your days that you would not believe, even if you were told. I'm raising up the Babylonians. God goes on to say, you you don't see an answer to your prayers? I'm already on to it, God says. I'm already doing it. I'm raising up. The idea of already, it's already in the... 
It's already in, in, the, in the plan. You think evil has slipped off the reins. You think I can't control human evil. I'm raising up. I'm going to use. I'm going to accomplish my plan of saving with this lot that he goes on to describe, the Babylonians. And he's saying effectively, I've got this lot on my reins. Look at verse 6 and onwards. I'm raising up the Babylonians, that ruthless and impetuous people who sweep across the whole earth to seize dwelling places not their own. The Babylonians in this case are dreaded, they're a fierce and dreaded people. Verse 7, it says that, a law unto themselves. But they're on my reins. They're on my reins. I'm holding the reins of them, God says. That's how I can control human evil and misery and all that's wrong with this world. To accomplish my great and glorious plan, I'm, they're not, they've not slipped off the reins. And if you think about it, it's the consistent message of the Bible, isn't it? God is always, whatever you might see, God is always in control. He's always holding the reins. And we've got the supreme example of that at the cross, haven't we? At the cross. Never was there a moment of greater injustice. Never had things ever looked like they'd gone quite so obviously wrong than at the cross. But of course, however things look, God doesn't get it wrong. God was holding the reins. And it didn't look like it. At the cross, it didn't look like it to all the world. Like God was in control of that violence and that evil. And we could use the words of Habakkuk chapter 5. Uh, sorry, uh, chapter 1 verse 5. It, it was something that you would not believe even if you were told. If you were there and you looked and you saw the cross. And of course God may not go about this brilliant plan the way we would expect. His good plan. This, this, this very best ocean plan where it's really at. We might even call his ways horribly unbelievable. And in fact, in the next few verses in Habakkuk, that's exactly what he does, if you like. But nothing ever goes wrong as far as that plan is concerned. And I want to just keep driving that message home this morning. Because if we could just grasp it, it will make all the difference. The reason why I was chose this, uh, I think the Lord led me to, to, to share this passage and that message with you this morning is as I was thinking about the week of prayer. Um, because it ought to inspire us to prayer. You know, my heart's desire is that we would, we, would, we, would, we would open the floodgates to being a church or a praying church this, this year. We would be those who are dependent on the Lord and praying to him. And Habakkuk is unusual. And why... I was led to this passage is because Habakkuk, the whole book itself, is a prayer. I don't know if you realize that. Um, Habakkuk was a praying man, and the whole book is nothing but prayer, actually. It, all the other books of the prophets, the prophets seem to be speaking to the people. But this is all about Habakkuk speaking to God. It's, a, it's like an extended prayer. And it doesn't seem likely to me that God was telling Habakkuk that everything was going to plan so that Habakkuk would sort of shut up and stop praying. That doesn't seem likely that that was God's intention here. Now, if nothing else, shot through this message that God has in this book of Habakkuk, we ought to expect truth that actually motivates us to prayer. And we all do need that, don't we? Because we all do feel it difficult to feel motivated to pray, if we're honest. So how? How does the truth that nothing ever goes wrong... How does that drive us to prayer? Where's the connection? To say that nothing ever goes wrong would seem to make prayer pointless, wouldn't it? If nothing ever goes wrong and God is going to accomplish his plans anyway, then why pray? Yeah? That would seem to be the case, wouldn't it? Time for a funny, you look like you've fallen asleep a little bit. Um, that's not me, unfortunately. Um, that's a picture from the Olympics. Uh, Wes sent me this on the phone. I thought it was funny. It got me laughing, actually. You did, didn't you, Wes? You might have seen it. Some of you, you might have sent it to some of you, too. Um, 
picture of a, uh, um, the Olympics we just had, and there's a lifeguard. Can you see the lifeguard? Lifeguard at the Olympics, and the uh, and the um, the caption under the picture was this: If you f- ever feel useless, remember that someone is a lifeguard at the Olympic swimming event. Think about it. You thinking about it? If you ever feel useless, remember. Lifeguards at the Olympics. That's a great picture of something pointless, isn't it? Pointless. Of course, it isn't really, because you still need them. But it is, let's let's face it, pointless. And he's got a great expression to prove it. Um, And if nothing ever goes wrong... Go off that a minute. Can we go to a black screen or something? Because otherwise you'll just be looking at these pecs and not listening to me. If nothing ever goes wrong, and God is going to accomplish his plans regardless anyway, what's the point of prayer? Yeah? It's pointless. It's pointless, isn't it? Well, no, for two reasons. It's where, uh, which is where we're going to finish up today. Okay? So, reason number one. Okay, get this? Get ready? God listened to and spoke back to Habakkuk, a man. Habakkuk's just a man. The God who never makes mistakes and always accomplishes his purpose listened to and spoke back to Habakkuk. Wow. And the idea of that kind of intimacy of a father who listens and responds as a child speaks is the very picture that the Bible uses to describe a believer's privilege today, you and I. So we can go to passages like in John's Gospel, we're reminded that we're children of God. All who received Jesus, who believed in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. He's the father, I'm the child. And do you remember how Jesus taught his disciples to pray? How did that begin? The Lord's Prayer, Jesus said, this is how you're to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, our Father. That intimacy. Habakkuk spoke, God listened, God spoke back to Habakkuk. I think maybe maybe a picture will help it to illustrate. Um, do you know who that is? Yeah, somebody said it. Kennedy, yeah? President Kennedy in the, uh, in the West Wing, uh, in the Oval Room, in the White House, at this uh, famous desk, um, making great decisions. You know, one of the most powerful men at the time, we would still say, you know, the American president, one of the most powerful people. Yeah? And there, there's a picture, a famous picture um, of Kennedy um, doing that. Yeah? Okay, and it's a it's a good picture, but it's not a complete picture, because the actual picture is 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 this. Okay, that's the real picture. And under the desk of the great president of the United States, making great stately decisions, is little JFK Jr., John Jr., just scrabbling around by his dad's legs. Which let's only he could do, only he could do. But he could do it because he was his child, he was his son. There, so he was there, he was there, but you didn't see it at the time, did you? He was just a little bit hidden on the picture. There's, see, you saw the top of his head. On the bottom there, but it's there. I, I think that's, that's a picture which kind of captures what I'm trying to say here, in a way. God listened to Habakkuk and he responded to him. Well, he would, wouldn't he? Because he's the father and he's the, he's the son. And look at that, that, that picture. And, 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 and let's remember, you know, um, if, if that was the case for John Jr., how much more so for us? I mean, there is a how much more so where it applies to us and the Lord, doesn't it? Because President Kennedy Sr. made mistakes, 
And he might have been powerful, but he wasn't all powerful. But we have the privilege of knowing a father who never makes mistakes. Every, nothing ever goes wrong. Always accomplishes his plans and purposes. And we are his children. Wow. Motivation to prayer because of knowing the character of God. Second one. Um, uh, the second one really is, is thinking about what it means as we pray. And it depends on a simple definition of prayer, which I read in a book once, and I think it's quite helpful. Asking God for things. Prayer is asking God for, for things. Now, I know prayer is a lot more than that, but it's never less than that. It's never less than that because that's what we're doing when we're praying. Isn't it? We're expressing our dependence and asking him for things. Um, and when we pray next week, we're going to be asking God for things. So let's pause and consider who it is that we're asking when we pray from what we've just seen in Habakkuk. We're asking the one who has the grandest, most marvelous plan, who is so in control that history is his story. Okay, History is his story. The one who makes sure that nothing has ever, is ever, or will ever go wrong as far as anything that matters for all eternity is concerned. That's the one we will be asking as we pray. And you know what that God, that God says, the God of the Bible? He says, ask. He says, ask me for things. Please turn up with me, Matthew chapter 7. And let's just see this in black and white. Page 685, if you've got the church Bible. Matthew chapter 7. And... Uh, and, and reading at verse 7, so 7-7, seven, seven, Matthew 7, verse 7. It's page 685 if you've got the church Bibles. Ask and it will be given to you. Seek and you will find. Knock and the door will be opened to you. For everyone who asks receives. The one who seeks finds. And to the one who knocks, the door will be opened. Which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then, though you are evil, he's talking about us as fathers, as human beings, know how to give good gifts to your children, and by and large that's what fathers do, even the imperfect ones, how much more will your Father in heaven Give good gifts to those who ask him. There it is in black and white. This Father God with his glorious plan says, ask. Do you imagine that if we ask for things he knows are good for us, that he won't grant those requests? Do you imagine that he won't? Really? Really? Of course, we think I won't ask God because he's thought about it already. What's the point? Oh, yes, that's true to some extent. But your asking and my asking is what we were made to do to bring about his glorious plan. So we're part of that. It is our privilege as children of the Father. So I hope you can see why uh, we've been spending a bit of time in this, this chapter um, this morning and as it relates to, to the week of prayer. Let me say to, to you, if you're a believer here this morning, we get to depend on the one who is writing all of human history so that nothing ever goes wrong. We get to depend. We get to have an intimate relationship through prayer with, with that God, the God of the Bible. That's a wonderful, wonderful privilege. And perhaps you're here as a non-Christian or somebody who's exploring this Christian faith you've heard about and you, uh, you, you, you're, 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 you're coming and you're listening and we're glad that you're doing that. And we're glad that you're, you're inquiring because it's the most wonderful news. Um, but the message to you this morning from this passage is, do you realize how awesomely in control this God of the Bible is? Um, your story is part of his big 
plan, whether you like it or not. It's part of his story, whether you like it or not. Um, And we will have to say to you this morning, there is such a thing as the wicked and the righteous, as far as the Bible is concerned. But gloriously, I can stand here and say that to you, not not um, not from a in in a proud way or an arrogant way, because righteousness is by faith in what Christ has done. None of us can ever deserve to be right with Him, to have this intimate relationship with the One who makes everything happen. Except at the cross, God makes enemies friends. And he says to you this morning, if you're here inquiring, he says, don't wait any longer. Come. Come. Come to me. And let me make the... My plan is going to happen anyway. But let me make it gloriously wonderful for you as well. Well, we're going to have... Uh, we're going to finish there. What we're going to do is we're going to sing in a moment um, before we have communion. Um, another reason why this chapter is appropriate, just as we, we think about these emblems and these symbols now, and what we've just been talking about. Um, another reason why this chapter is appropriate is because when we begin a series in Romans, we're going to hear Paul quoting this book of Habakkuk in the first chapter. And Paul is going to be using this book to remind people of this truth. The righteous live by faith. The righteous shall live by faith. Because for Habakkuk, everything seemed to be going wrong. And when God says to him in this book of Habakkuk in chapter 2, which we we won't look at, but it says, when God says to Habakkuk, the righteous shall live by faith, It was a reminder to Habakkuk to put his faith in the God of the Bible who had, at a point in the past, set his grand salvation plan in motion and had given plenty of evidence that it was rolling forward unstoppably. And he was saying to Habakkuk, look back and see. I've set this plan in motion. I'm making it happen. Nothing has ever gone wrong and nothing will go wrong, Habakkuk. The righteous shall live by faith. And as we come to these emblems now, we have a greater privilege than Habakkuk of being able to look back to the cross and the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and to know for certain that nothing did ever, nothing is ever and nothing will ever go wrong. The Lord Jesus Christ himself at the cross said, it is finished. And our call to live by faith is not a kind of cross your finger, hope that it's going to all work out okay. It's a call to live by faith in what these symbols represent as we look back to something that really happened, the cross and the resurrection of Christ. So it's a call to live by faith in what these symbols represent. The the, the broken bread, a a picture of Christ's body broken for us in order that his, his promises will be accomplished. The wine, an emblem of Jesus' blood spilt, poured out for us in order that God's salvation plan would be accomplished. So we're going to sing before we um, have communion together. And we're going to sing before the throne of God above. I have a strong and perfect plea. What is the strong and perfect plea that we have before the throne of God? It's this. The broken body and the blood of Christ, which these symbols represent, is the strong and perfect plea that we have as we come before the throne of God. So it's an appropriate song to sing before we have communion. So I think we'll stand to sing it. Before the throne of God, I have a strong and perfect plea. And let's think about those emblems as being that's the plea that we are making as we come before uh, before the throne of God. So let's stand together and sing this, shall we?